right, good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for that harsh cut, uh, but welcome to uh, Library Company Fireside Chats. I am Will Fenton, Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company. Uh, the Library Company, uh, as you probably know, was founded by Benjamin Franklin, uh, 1731. Today, we are an independent research library with specializations in business history and political economy, graphic arts, women's history, and African-American history. And some of the folks that help us to explore those collections are our research fellows. Um, we give out between 55 and 60 research fellowships a year to uh, folks from a number of different disciplines from all over the world who come here and help us uh, learn what we have and why it's exciting. Uh, and they've also been instrumental in sustaining this webinar series, uh, which we kicked off eek coming up on a year now. We started it back in mid-April of 2020. So um, I'm delighted that we are still doing this and that's sustained by the generosity of our research fellows. And I personally really enjoy learning about all the wonderful work that they're doing. Uh, it's been a great platform for uh, books and works in progress. So you might notice that this is a little different from some of the Zooms you've been on. Um, you aren't on display in any way. Your camera isn't enabled, your audio isn't enabled. That is by design. We want you to take a break, it's a Thursday night. Um, but even so, uh, we invite you to participate and you can participate through the chat functionality. That's a great way to exchange, to share resources that you might think of as our uh, guest is presenting. And then of course, you can also use the Q&A thread, which are the overlapping dialogue buttons at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you, if you have a question, put it there because my eyes aren't great and I will lose track of things in the chat functionality. So we will set aside a little bit of time at the end of this talk uh, to engage your questions. As soon as you have it, put it into Q&A. And of course, if you really enjoy this and you wanna share it with anyone who might've missed it, um, this will be automatically recorded and made available through our SoundCloud channel, which feeds our podcast, Talking in a Library as well as our YouTube channel. So you'll have a video recording that you can share with anyone that you wish. Um, but with that, let me introduce our guest speaker tonight. Adam, you're welcome to join us here on, on, a, on a display. Dr. Adam Gordon is Associate Professor of English at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, where he teaches early and 19th century American literature, another lit studies guy, I love that. He received his BA from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles. Before starting at Whitman, Adam served as the Greenfield Dissertation Fellow at the Library Company of Philadelphia. That is our, our, our long-term dissertation fellowship, as well as the Hench Postdoctoral uh, Dissertation Fellow at the American Antiquarian Society and held the William K. Peck and Mellon Foundation Fellowships at the Huntington Library. His work has appeared in journals such as American Literature, Arizona Quarterly, Early American Literature, and the Nathaniel Hawthorne Review, some stellar publications there. Today, Dr. Gordon will share his new book, Prophets, Publicists, and Parasites, Antebellum Print Culture and the Rise of the Critic, which was published just last year by the University of Massachusetts Press. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not there in Philadelphia with you, I, as, as you Noted, I went to UPenn, I had the Greenfield Dissertation Fellowship, so I really love Philadelphia, but I'll, I'll have to visit at a later time after the pandemic is over. <laughs> um, all right, so let me uh, share my uh, slides, get this up. Okay. Um, well, I can't um, see you, but does it, is that displaying okay? I don't see your slides quite yet. Do you want to give it another shot? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, there we go. Magic. Perfect. All right. Great. OK. Well, first off, um, I want to thank all of you for uh, taking some time to, to be here today and to, to learn a little bit about my book. Um, and about the, the weird and wild world of 19th century criticism. Uh, so I just wanted to start off with a, a few things. Uh, firstly, thank you to Will for organizing this really amazing series of fireside chats. Um, amid all of the challenges of the pandemic, I can't think of a better way to bring people together 
and to make the best of this new virtual world that COVID has wrought. So, um, so thank you. I, I also wanted to thank the library company more generally for supporting my research over the years. Um, 18 years ago, it's crazy to think it was that long. When I was an undergrad at UPenn, I took a class on the history of the book with Peter Stolybras and Roger Chartier. And I'll always remember those class sessions when we met at the library company, um, looking at pieces of paper from the Stamp Act, books printed by Ben Franklin and other early American treasures. Uh, it was there that I first experienced the thrill of archival discovery, that feeling of intimacy with history that research archives produce. Um, and these are just some images from a kind of a more, re more recent trip I had to the library company right before the pandemic started. Um, it was a foundation that shaped my methodological orientation as a scholar. Um, as throughout grad school at UCLA, I continued to be fascinated with book history and print culture studies, with the ways that encounters with material texts change your understanding of both literature and culture. Years later, I was fortunate enough to take part in the McNeil Center's material text summer seminar, which also met at the library company. Indeed, it was the early foundation provided by the library company that helped shape the conception of my dissertation, a project that asked what literary criticism in the 19th century looked like as a lived practice. What forms did it take? What roles did it serve within American culture, the dawn of the era of industrial print? And when I received the Greenfield Dissertation Fellowship in 2010, I had the incredible opportunity to serve as a fellow at the library company, transforming the dissertation by giving it a stronger archival basis. I'm deeply grateful to Jim Green, Connie King, Rachel D'Agostino, and the whole rest of the library company staff. I can honestly say that this book wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of the institution. Um, it makes me tremendously happy too, to be able to give a talk today about my book at the very place where that book was born. Um, and there are also countless others that have supported and guided me over the years as well friends and family, including my parents, my sister, and my partner, Molly, professors at UPenn and UCLA, colleagues both in, uh, at Whitman College and elsewhere, peer reviewers, the editorial team at UMass Press. All of you helped make this book, and I'm deeply grateful. Um, and thanks, finally, to everyone who's bought the book so far. Um, and if you're interested in getting a copy, here it is. Um, you can order it at UMass Press website, Amazon, lots of other places. And actually, it's pretty cheap as far as academic books go. They, they came out straight in paperback, which is a, um, a nice thing that UMass does, makes it affordable. Okay, now, before I jump into the heart of my book's argument, which is rooted in the 19th century, I want to start with a more recent episode that I bring up in my book's coda. So I teach in Walla Walla, Washington, as Will mentioned, um, a small town located in Eastern Washington state. But a few years ago in the summer of 2016, I decided to spend the summer in Seattle as I finished up my book manuscript. And uh, at the time I was searching for publishers. Uh, at the time, amazon.com, which is based in Seattle, had recently opened a pilot brick and mortar bookstore, which they called Amazon Books. Here's an image of it. Since then, it has expanded to 19 stores in 10 states, but at the time, it was a relatively new experiment and one that struck me as odd. I mean, after all, it was online behemoths like Amazon that helped put bookstore chains like Borders and Walden Books out of business to say nothing of small independent bookstores. But I love books and I was curious, so I headed to the upscale University Village Shopping Center near the University of Washington to check it out. In many ways, the store was similar to other retail chains like Barnes and Noble, though it distinguished itself from them by ruthlessly applying the logic of online book selling driven by algorithms and user data to the brick and mortar bookstore. For instance, uh, on the left behind this browsing customer was a table of books, quote, rated 4.8 or above by users. So too, the books were shelved cover out rather than spine out, as you can see on the right, replicating the experience of internet browsing and prioritizing best sellers over an extensive backlist of slower sellers. Yet what struck me most was the small placard that the clerks placed beneath each book. Aside from a barcode that you could scan to bring the book up on your phone on the Amazon website, each book contained a blurb from an Amazon customer who had reviewed, this, reviewed the book. 
There it is closer up. For example, beneath a copy of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, a card noted the reaction of, quote, a customer that read, quote, chilling, moving, vivid, terrifying, and sometimes even humorous, The Handmaid's Tale is a profoundly moral story. It is a true masterpiece of power and grace that will someday attain the status of a classic. The card added that 217 people found this review helpful and that the book's 2,063 reviews earned it an average of 4.1 stars. Now, at the time, I was finishing up a book about criticism in antebellum America, right? this book I'm talking about today, a period when the rise of industrial print transformed the landscape of books and criticism. And here in the 21st century, the digital revolution was doing so again. While newspaper book review sections were shuttering and academic presses were struggling to stay afloat, online reviews were helping to steer customers' buying decisions along with the raw data of likes and stars. Now, of course, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, okay, Adam, but an Amazon review isn't really criticism in the same way that a Stephen Greenblatt book on Shakespeare or a book review in the New York Times by Mashiku Kakutani is. Yet part of what my uh, project tries to do is recuperate the full range of forms that criticism takes and to ask what these forms tell us about the role of literary criticism within our culture. To be sure, an Amazon review of The Handmaid's Tale isn't the same as, say, a professional review by Daniel Mendelssohn or a scholarly monograph on 20th century dystopian novels. But each one reflects a different culture of critical practice that together gives us a more comprehensive sense of the place of literary criticism and indeed of literature itself within our culture. What this moment shares with the 19th century, I'd suggest, is a sense of disruption to critical norms brought on by rapid technological change as we confront, depending on who you ask, either democratization or degradation of criticism, as well as a proliferation of outlets for criticism. Amid cultural overload, we increasingly turn to criticism to help us make choices, to winnow the grain from the chaff, whether that be a James Wood or Emily Nussbaum review in The New Yorker, or a critical amalgamator like Rotten Tomatoes, there on your right. While my project is set in the antebellum period, I find these comparisons productive helping us see more clearly both our own moment and the more remote world of the mid 19th century. While the digital transition has caused criticism to reorient itself in the past few decades, in the antebellum period, from roughly 1830 to 1860, the American critical industry experienced its first great period of expansion, including the emergence of a new kind of figure, the professional critic. These developments were driven by a series of technological changes, transforming antebellum print culture, as Americans witnessed what scholars have termed the cheap print revolution. In the 1830s and 40s, the rise of industrial print alongside improved transportation and communication infrastructure and a centralizing print industry expanded the reach while decreasing the price of literature. We see the rise of major publishing houses like Putnam's and Harper's. At the same time, the number of venues in which criticism appeared, periodicals in particular, increased, making critics a more central figure. It was the golden age of periodicals, as, as a historian Frank Luther Mott termed it. For while in 1825 there were less than 100 non-newspaper periodicals, by 1850 there were approximately 600. The advent of the penny press, beginning with Benjamin Day's New York Sun in 1833, lowered the price of newspapers from six cents to one or two cents, resulting in a spike from 65 daily papers with a combined circulation of 78,000 in 1830 to 138 papers with a combined circulation of 300,000 in 1840. This print revolution was accompanied by a corresponding reading revolution. Literacy rates expanded along with the growth of new reading demographics among women, children, and the working classes. Improvements in eyeglasses and lighting made reading less of a strain on the eyes. So too, book historians point to a shift from so-called intensive reading to extensive reading. While in the 18th century, readers tended to buy fewer books and read them over and over again, the Bible, Shakespeare, and Almanac, by the mid 19th century, amid a growing Victorian commodity culture, readers began buying more books and magazines, which they read just once, 
these changes confronted readers with a daunting sense of print surplus, of there being too much to know, to borrow Anne Blair's title. And while this sense of being overwhelmed by books wasn't new, the anxiety reached a larger number of readers, while the problem itself was exacerbated by the increased capacities of production and distribution. Yet these changes also had the effect of elevating the figure of the critic, who became increasingly important for helping readers navigating the helping readers navigate the new landscape of print. While some viewed these developments with skepticism, others viewed them positively. For instance, as Edward Terrell Channing, the Boylston Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory at Harvard, noted in his lecture turned essay, Forms of Criticism, quote, within the present century, English reviews have risen to an importance that they never knew before. And the change is so striking an event in the recent literary history, it is so truly a distinction of the age that it receives great consideration from those who carefully observe the times. Instead of short analyses, summaries of literary news and light slight strictures, reviews now contain elaborate investigations of the subjects of works, of the genius of authors, the principles of criticism, the faults and beauties of style and language. There is no dispute that they are part of our most popular, fashionable, and instructive reading and fill a large place in public and private libraries. Subjects of all sort, of local and temporary, of general and permanent interest, the opinions of others upon them, the manner in which others have treated them are placed within the reach of everybody so that it will not do for anyone who reads it all to neglect the journals if he would be prepared to talk with all upon much that is occupying them. The owner of a perfect series of good reviews has, I will not say a systematic, but a most instructive and agreeable account of the period over which it extends in almost every point of view. Now, throughout the antebellum period, the critic became a recurring topic of discussion, alternately hailed as heroic bulwarks against the ever rising tide of books, and alternately as parasites, hacks, and vultures, making their living by cutting down their intellectual superiors or corruptly serving the interests of the publishing industry. As such, just as we see numerous celebrations of the critic as the heroic man of letters, we also see numerous caricatures of critics sawing through books and impaling authors. We see them portrayed as pretentious dandies, pompously casting judgment on works of art, and alternately as bottom feeding vermin. This brings me to one of my favorite images, which is on the cover of my book, in which several cute little books beg for their lives, offering bribes to no avail as they're impaled by the quills of heartless critics. Finally, nowhere is this contrast between the two conceptions, heroic man of letters and parasite, better seen than in two contemporaneous illustrations of Edgar Allan Poe. One, dignified and sedate, appearing as part of Graham's Our Contributor series, the other in his capacity as the Tomahawk, a nickname Poe earned based on his reputation for slashing reviews and appearing in Holden's Dollar Magazine. It wasn't just comic illustration that these sorts of critiques of critics um, in which these sorts of critiques of critics thrived. Rather, these lampoons were a graphic subset of a broader literary genre that I term critical fiction, in which critics and criticism became fodder for imaginative literature, a genre that included books like Fanny Fern's Ruth Hall, Herman Melville's Pierre, as well as lesser known works like this 1832 story that you're looking at in the New York Mirror, entitled The Young Author or the Effects of Criticism in which a sensitive young poet quite literally dies as the result of several cruel reviews. Yet whether hailed or satirized, pretty much everyone agreed that the current era was a critical age. This then is the setting for my book, which takes as its subject the American critical institution during its first great period of expansion, an expansion that prompted near continuous debates over the prop proper function of literary criticism in an expanding reading public. Yet my book also departs from previous treatments of the topic by focusing less on enumerating aesthetic theories, on detailing the clashes of comp competing cliques and coteries, Whigs or Democrats, Knickerbockers or Young America, or on the overarching paradigm of literary nationalism and more on the various uses of criticism served within the culture. Uses that I argue were closely aligned with the printed form criticism took. To be sure, literary nationalism 
was one concern of critics, but it wasn't the only concern. The book also resists what I've come to think of as the Nortonization of literary criticism, the tendency to homogenize diverse expressions of critical practice into a single print form. Rather, adopting book history and print culture methodologies, I return to the archives to examine the variety of material forms that criticism took during this period of rapid critical growth. Despite the prevalence of book history and print culture studies as critical methodologies, literary criticism itself has remained curiously exempt from materially focused examinations. Yet these different forms, I argue, not only shaped the critical arguments contained, but revealed a variety of different functions that criticism served in antedolm culture, from helping scholars keep pace with an international knowledge economy, to lively entertainment, to serving as effective political weapons amid the escalating slavery crisis. Moreover, criticism served all these differing functions at once, while a single critic writing for different venues often adapted his or her theories to suit the context. In this sense, at its broadest level, the book raises the still timely question, what's criticism for? Indeed, one of the first challenges, challenges in writing about literary criticism is settling on a definition of it. In its origins, the word critic comes from the Greek kritikos, or one capable of judging, a classical definition that Noah Webster in the American Dictionary of the English Language published in 1828, draws on in defining criticism as, quote, the art of judging with propriety of the beauties and faults of a literary performance, end quote. Already in the 19th century, this fundamentally neoclassical view was coming under attack with the rise of romantic critical theory, which insisted that the critic's job was to appreciate and explain works of genius for readers rather than judge based on fixed standards of taste. Rene Wellick, reflecting on his eight volume History of Modern Criticism, in contrast to Webster's traditionally narrow understanding, defined criticism broadly as, quote, any discourse on literature. More recently, Andrew Ford in Origins of Criticism, Literary Culture and Poetic Theory in Classical Greece, defined criticism as, quote, any public act of praise or blame upon a performance or song, a definition rooted in the largely oral literary culture of ancient Greece. In the invention of English criticism, 1650 to 1760, by contrast, Michael Gavin, who also follows a book history methodology, distinguishes, quote, critical writing, defined as the generically heterogeneous mix of texts that engage arguments about poetry, plays, and prose fiction, from, quote, criticism, defined more broadly as the socially realized exercise of judgment. A surprising number of scholars don't define criticism at all when they're talking about it. In my own book, I argue that the definition of literary criticism is contingent upon the forms through which it's circulated. At its most general level, literary criticism is writing about books, a field of discourse that takes as its jumping off point other works. Depending on where a piece of criticism appeared, the nature and character of these responses could vary widely, from the brief abstracts of literary notices to surveys of entire intellectual fields from blunt evaluations of quality to sensitive explorations of authorial intent, from practical reviews to meta-discursive discussions of the nature of criticism itself. By critical forms, one of, one of my other main terms, meanwhile, I mean two intertwined and overlapping structures. The print media through which criticism circulated, for instance, monthly magazines, daily newspapers, anthologies, pamphlets, and the critical genres through which it expressed itself, a brief notice, lengthy review essay, tabloid literary gossip, et cetera. As such, critical form encompasses both print media and critical genre, the periodical of the dial and the genre of the literary notices section at the back of the dial, an anthology and an authorial headnote. As a result, in organizing the book, Instead of charting change over time or dueling critical movements, typical organizations for other books, each chapter focuses on a different form of criticism during the roughly the same period of time. One of my central arguments in the book, meanwhile, is that critical debates grounded themselves in debates over specific critical forms, as observers discuss the impact of, say, reviews in daily newspapers or wide circulation popular monthly magazines 
it was these print media that provided a concrete focus for otherwise abstract arguments about literature and criticism, tethering a realm of ideas to a world of daily experience. If this argument is new, the framework isn't. For instance, Edward Channing, who we saw before, organized his account of critical practice according to the quote, forms of criticism, differentiating five main types, which he terms private criticism, critical editions, or what he calls annotators, literary histories, aesthetics philosophy, and literary reviews. I would suggest that we can name significantly more than five. Amid the rapid expansion of industrial print culture, the number of critical forms proliferated. In this slide, I've listed a sampling that shows the wide range of critical expressions from the debates conducted by literary societies to diary entries, all of which point to different social and cultural functions for criticism. In the five chapters of my book, I limit myself to just five of these, primarily from the printed and periodical realms, since these were the forms through which criticism reached its largest audience. Yet in the course of writing the book, I saw just how much work remains to be done on other iterations of critical culture. Specifically, in each chapter, I focus on one significant critical form and the debates that surrounded those forms focusing my analysis on a well-known critical figure associated with the critical mode in question. In chapter one, for instance, Cutting Corners with Emerson, I begin with Ralph Waldo Emerson in the Quarterly Review. For Emerson, criticism helped, the scholars helped make the scholar's task more manageable, providing invaluable glosses and digests of works. Here I argue for the crucial role that criticism in the Quarterly Reviews played within an international knowledge culture offering scholars condensed surveys of not only books or thinkers, but entire surveys and fields. It also helped overcome the material challenges of access to books by introducing thinkers like Emerson and Theodore Parker, pictured here in an illustration by Christopher Peirce Cranch, um, to new strains of thought, and all within an easily accessible form. Um, and this, this um, caricature that Cranch drew is supposedly of Theodore Parker being very excited in a German bookstore because he could find all these books that he couldn't access otherwise. At the same time, Emerson's own arguments adapted themselves to suit their context, whether lecture or print, while at the broadest level, his anxieties regarding the overwhelming number of books confronting the modern reader shaped Emerson's own critical theory. And in particular, his rejection of the burden of tradition and the proclamation of intellectual self-reliance made famous in lectures and essays like the American Scholar and Literary Ethics. So this is the sort of work each chapter does, tracing the reciprocal influence of critical forms and critical theories, as well as the practical functions criticism served in the culture. In chapter two, I move from the quarterly essay to the literary anthology as I trace debates over the role of the literary compilation in giving shape to an American canon. Not only did anthologies give concrete form to critical judgments, they expressed theories of literary history. For Rufus Griswold, America's first professional anthologist, anthologies made American literature's strengths and deficiencies visible to the current generation, thereby establishing a path for future achievements. Yet at the same time, his anthologies were limited by the physical constraints of the book as commodity, tensions that produced heated debates with his adversaries, the Die King brothers, on just what principles American anthologies should abide by. And I should add, it was a lot easier to make an anthology of poetry than it was of prose, a problem he confronted very quickly. In chapter three, I turned to Poe, who was a linchpin of sorts for the project. For while Poe insisted that the national literature would not improve without fearless, honest critics, he also felt that criticism was superfluous to the true aims and experience of art. And though he wrote over a thousand reviews, he worried constantly about the increasing corruption of the critical industry. These contradictions, I argue, were rooted in part in Poe's close association with the form of the wide circulation popular monthly magazine, magazines like Graham's and Godey's in which criticism, as well as the antics of bickering literati, became a form of popular entertainment in its own right. In chapter four, I explore Margaret Fuller's career as a newspaper critic. While Fuller made a name for herself as editor of the Transcendentalist Dial, 
She left New England in 1844 to take a position as literary editor of Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. In the 18 months that Fuller occupied that post, she turned the genre of the newspaper book review, long disparaged as the lowest form of criticism, into a respected medium for the genre, inaugurating the tradition of the newspaper book review in the United States and deploying it in the service of social reform. If newspapers empowered the critical office by expanding its audience and the demographic, demographic range of its readership, however, the ephemerality of the material form also limited the temporal reach of her writing, right? People don't keep newspaper if they throw them out. As a result, though the newspaper medium made Fuller the most widely read American critic of her day, it also proved debilitating to her critical legacy. Finally, in chapter five, I trace the critical response to Uncle Tom's Cabin in three critical forms that have been largely ignored in critical history. Pamphlet reviews, critical companion volumes, and reprinted reviews and periodicals. Much of this chapter focuses on the phenomenon of critical reprinting, a practice that challenges 20th century conceptions of critical value. As I argue in this concluding chapter, however, the very same material characteristics that have rendered these forms marginal, if not invisible within critical history, in fact points to the social centrality of criticism as editors like Frederick Douglass harness the power of reprinting to turn criticism into a powerful weapon within the ongoing debates over slavery and abolition. In the process, we see how a material approach to literary criticism provides a fuller and more empowered sense of the role criticism plays within our culture. In the remaining few minutes of this presentation, I wanna show you what this critical approach looks like in practice with a few examples from the final chapter of the project. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, we find a book that not only strained the conventions of literary criticism, but foisted it to the center of the cultural and political arena. The scale of the novel's success produced a media frenzy with one reviewer for Putnam's declaring that the novel had ushered in a new age of print. Almost immediately, critics fanned out to cover what had rapidly turned into a cultural phenomenon. They reported on the novel's unprecedented sales and on Boston publisher John P. Jewett's attempts to keep up with them. They reported on spin-offs, reception abroad in England and elsewhere, and published remarks by prominent figures. Above all, criticism reprinted and responded to other criticism as the cycle of reviewing became a self-generating engine distinct from the novel itself. The flood of responses forced criticism into instant self-reflexivity, moreover. Within weeks, commentators couldn't begin an article without reference to the redundancy of their task. Southerners in particular couldn't attack the novel without first noting that all refutations had already been made. The novel also began testing the traditional parameters of criticism as reviews started bursting at their seams, running to 40 pages or spreading out in multiple installments. As one frustrated Southern critic, Louisa McCord complained, quote, but what argument avails against broad, flat, impudent assertion? The greatest villain may swear down an honest man and the greatest falsehoods are oftenest those which it is impossible to disprove. But our argument is becoming so prolix that we must cut it short. We could run on for 50 pages showing our author's blunders and inconsequences. These quotations are so delightfully racy that we find it difficult to abridge them, but we are fast, fast nearing the utmost limit of our article and must stop. McCord wasn't the only one to feel limited by the traditional constraints of the book review. Indeed, one of the most noticeable phenomena prompted by the success of Uncle Tom's Cabin was the widespread practice of reprinting reviews as pamphlets, a tactic that helped overcome the limitations on length, audience, and temporal shelf life involved in periodical publication. For some critics, even the enlarged format of pamphlets proved too constricting, prompting the development of a new phenomenon in American critical history, the production of book-length reviews, point-by-point -point critical rebuttals of Stowe's novel stretching to hundreds of pages and issued as standalone volumes, often with elaborate production value in their own right, a critical subgenre that included Stowe's own A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Just as pamphlets recirculated reviews, periodicals like Frederick Douglass's paper also frequently reprinted reviews and notices from other papers. As I surveyed the response to Uncle Tom's Cabin in the early black press, and in Frederick Douglass's paper in particular, I began to notice a peculiarity. 
Though Douglas's journal treated the novel extensively, scholars tended to return to only a handful of these critical responses. As I asked why, I began to see that the reason had something to do not with Douglas, but, but with our 21st century definitions of what constitutes critical authority. Namely, we tend to privilege original signed reviews by critics of established reputation that take familiar forms readily recognizable as serious criticism. Conversely, scholars tend to discount criticism that is anonymous, reprinted from other papers, or by amateur correspondents, and that employ less traditional critical forms with low authority. This is what happened in studies of reviews of Uncle Tom's Cabin in Frederick Douglass's paper, which returned over and over to a few signed articles by well-known Black writers like Douglas, William J. Wilson, who wrote under the name Ethiop, Martin Delaney, or William G. Allen. But as I discovered, these responses constituted only a very small number of the treatments of Stowe's novel. Rather, as I conducted my research, I found that between April 8, 1852 and April 1, 1853, roughly one year, Douglas included no fewer than 75 pieces that responded to Stowe's novel in some form or other. Of these, over 40 articles, more than half, were culled from other papers, a percentage that increases to two thirds when one includes reprinted addresses, minutes, and proceedings that address Stowe's novel. Douglas reprinted articles from over 25 different papers, from the Honolulu Friend to the Revue de Dumont, some of which were already reprints themselves. In lieu of an author, the articles are attributed to the source periodical. Rather, instead of privileging originality and critical identity, Douglas's editorial strategy followed what Laura Langer Cohen in describing the features of the early Black press terms a patchwork aesthetic. These critical responses took a wide variety of forms, moreover, which included reprinted reviews from other papers, accounts of sales numbers, international printings, reflections on the novel as a publishing phenomenon. They included minutes from congressional sessions and anti-slavery meetings and discovered Stowe's, that discussed Stowe's novel. They included biographical sketches of Stowe, news of her comings and goings, foreign travels, and reprinted addresses in honor of Stowe from abroad. They included accounts of controversy springing from the book, like the Reverend Joel Parker's libel suit, testimonials from Southerners attesting to the truth of the narrative, and accounts of dramatizations, dioramas, new editions. They included original and reprinted reviews of anti-Tom anti -tom novels, introductions from English editions, and remarks by British dignitaries. Above all, they included letters from correspondents praising or critiquing the novel and commenting on its impact. And these are just a few of them. Each of these different forms in turn revealed complex new dimensions for the critical arguments contained, connecting responses to the novel to a wide range of communities, social arenas, and print media whose respective powers Douglas harnessed through the, through the strategic act of reprinting. To give an example, in July of 1852, correspondent wrote into Douglas's paper to ask why he had never printed a quote proper notice in response to Stowe's novel. In the very same issue, however, Douglas included an account of a three-day trip to Ithaca, New York under the title letter from the editor. In traveling through the town, Douglas marveled at quote, the pleasing change in the public opinion of the place since his last visit 10 years earlier. In accounting for the change, Douglas notes that Though the fugitive slave law and the cumulative effect of anti-slavery lectures and papers must be held partly responsible, quote, it must be conceded that the most efficient agent in changing the sentiment of Ithaca, as well as elsewhere, must be set down to the circulation of Uncle Tom's Cabin. That book is but at the beginning of its career, and it goes like a fire through dry stubble, sweeping all before it. And yet, just the previous day, Douglas recorded his surprise and discomfort when, upon arriving at the scheduled address to the Black congregation of Zion Church, he discovered that the audience was, quote, contrary to my expectation and partly to my wishes, largely composed of white persons, adding his concern that, quote, there are some things which ought to be said to colored people in the peculiar circumstances in which they are placed that can be said more effectively among themselves without the presence of white persons. For as Douglas adds, we are the oppressed and the whites are the oppressors and the language I would address to the one is not always suited to the other. In the address that followed moreover, Douglas recalled that 
quote, I aimed to impress upon my friends in my speech the importance of helping themselves, a lesson that took on a decidedly ironic coloring given the largely white audience. Just as unconventional forms allowed Douglas to register contradictions, they also allowed him to provide an editorial buffer. For instance, in one essay entitled Negro Intellect, Ellison Douglas and Uncle Tom, reprinted from the national era, an unknown contributor, E, critiques the model of black victimhood represented by Uncle Tom, suggesting that both Douglas and Harrison W. Ellis, viewed by some as the model for Stowe's Uncle Tom, were both preferable to Stowe's vision of pious submission. As the contributor insists, instead of figures like Tom, quote, let us have more blacksmiths, scholars, orators, philosophers, and natural noblemen of the race. We have victims enough already, and sympathy for suffering will be most profitably replaced by admir admiration for invincible magnanimity. Piety, as in the case of Uncle Tom, and apparently in that of Reverend Ellis, is capable of being prostituted in the service of slavery. Because it acts upon the life mainly as a sentiment, it can be perverted into a sort of spiritual and moral handcuff and made to answer the master as a restraint upon natural liberty. Now, surely there were some who might bristle at Christian devotion being described as, quote, a moral and spiritual handcuff. But by reprinting the essay, Douglas could express the opinion without bearing responsibility for it. So too, through reprinting, Douglas could voice more militant views as when he printed the opinion of a contributor who goes by Psalms Nam who observed that the logical conclusion to be drawn from Uncle Tom's cabin was that, quote, it is proper and necessary to provide arms for fugitives at convenient places and to encourage and instruct them in their use. In the service of which he suggests the creation of a quote, fugitive arms fund. Finally, Douglas's embrace of a variety of critical forms allowed him to stage vibrant debates over topics of central concern, including the impact of works like Uncle Tom's cabin. The most famous of these is his, is his epistolary exchange with Martin Delaney over the appropriateness of accepting help in the anti-slavery cause from a white woman like Stowe, who as Delaney notes, quote, knows nothing about us. Douglas's reply that until the black community was in a stronger position, they should help accept help that was proffered was pragmatic, much like his approach to literary criticism. All of these examples, meanwhile, point to the rich critical conversations that existed in forms that didn't necessarily register as a quote, proper review. To conclude, much of the power of Douglas's strategy of reprinting comes from modes of authority that should look familiar to us in our age of Facebook and Twitter. Through reprinting, Douglas performed 19th century versions of sharing, liking, tweeting, and reposting. He helped articles go viral and created a comment section of sorts. Above all, through his newspaper, he created a forum for discussion among the black community, which privileged letters from correspondents as much as it did his own critical voice. Many of these forms that he employed carry either low critical authority by our modern definitions or don't qualify as criticism at all. Yet, as I've argued, they paradoxically point to the centrality of literary criticism within antebellum culture. So too, we might bring similar sorts of insights to our own moment. Could goodreads.com and Amazon reviews be a sign of criticism's cultural reach, its widespread adoption and evidence of engagement with social problems through books? Could a book review that's shared or reposted express new kinds of evidence of cultural impact? Rather than the often invoked crisis of the humanities, Perhaps we're entering a new age of critical participation. While I don't have definitive answers to these questions, I believe that an attention to critical form empowers us in our sense of what functions criticism performs in its reach within our culture. When we take a more expansive view of the forms that criticism takes, we see that it remains a vital genre for our culture to discuss its most pressing concerns, offering a hopeful view of the state of the humanities and literary criticism in the early decades of the 21st century. And with that, I'll stop there. Thanks again for listening. Thank you so much, Adam. I'm going to um, jump us back up. Oh, perfect. We're back in a conversation mode here. And um, I am 
uh, certainly attentive to the time. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, so anyone who has a question, please drop it right into the Q&A. I'm gonna kick us off and um, hopefully not offend anyone's sensibilities here. Uh, so that was a really optimistic take on where we are right now in terms of our lit culture. Um, yeah. But one thing that struck me when you were showing that first slide from the Amazon brick and mortars bookstore is how readers were identified. The nomenclature. A customer. Customer, yeah. yeah. And I mean, certainly I spent a lot of time working in the 18th century. You have subscribers, right? Um, 20th century, 21st century, you've got customers. How are readers identified in this antebellum period? I mean, because I think I, I think it's important, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of yeah, their relationship I mean, to the text? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, and that's, as, as I was saying in kind of the final example, I mean, the, the correspondence, right? I mean, many of them were readers and for that reason, kind of many of them weren't characterized as critics, even though a lot of their responses were as insightful as any published review we found, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so are you asking like, how were readers? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still imagining that there are mediated ways in which readers' enthusiasm or criticism is surfaced in publications outside of, say, Douglas's purview, right? Like just traditional newspapers and whatnot. Like, yeah. And, and certainly they're not being aggregated with the scale that Amazon does. I mean, we're not talking about thousands of people and, you know, sort of these false certainty of numeric scores, but yeah. But um, I'm, I, I'm curious to know like how readers are identified in when, when their criticism, be it in a, in a sort of mediated personal form is brought into the public sphere. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And I think the, the first, way that I think of in answering that is like one of the significant shifts when it comes to criticism at this period is a move away from an amateur conception of criticism, right, of the kind of the gentleman critic, mm -hmm. someone whose primary job was a, a lawyer or a doctor, but they enjoyed reading and they would write reviews and send them to journals and their kind of professional life would make them a legitimate arbiter of some sort of authority to a more kind of clearly defined professional critic. Mm -hmm. I mean, even that is often a little bit overstated um, because a lot of people that wrote professionally for magazines paradoxically were like, they're, they were seen as hacks, right? They were seen as journalists who were just writing all of this stuff yeah. and possibly then degrading it. But I think, you know, the, the question you're asking is like, you know, how, who got to be a critic, right? Who, um, if you are a reader responding and you write to a magazine, is that an official critical judgment or is that a letter from a contributor, right? Are you, um, and there was, it, it was a blurrier line, yeah. right? Yeah. To the degree to which um, even like someone was like Graham's, I mean, Grant, uh, George Graham, I mean, his big distinction was he started paying people more for contributing to his magazine instead of like getting free contributions from people. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know what they like would have been called exactly, but I think it was um, m more unstable. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, I think your, your question is a good one because even in our modern moment, right, if someone is a professional blogger, mm -hmm. right, but they're, they're not, there's no editorial apparatus, like, do we, how seriously do we take that? I mean, what gatekeepers are necessary? I mean, certainly like even on Amazon, if you write enough reviews, you become like, you know, one yeah. of these approved Amazon reviewers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the the conferring of authority is was kind of murky then, and yeah. it still is murky now. You know? It's sort of like getting certified on Twitter too. That's another way that you know there's 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 a level of gatekeeping even in these supposedly wide open techno utopian dreams. Um, yeah. We have a couple of questions, so I want to make sure that we get to those questions. Um, Sharon Elker, uh, thanks you for this important, innovative work and your excellent talk. I will second that. Um, she has a question based on some work that she's done in the early 19th century British criticism, so a transatlantic question. 
While going over book reviews of a particular novel I came across in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, innovative critical dialogues and knocks, oh man, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce this, I'm sorry, Ambrosian, Ambrosiani? I butcher that, I'm sure. A fictionalized series of conversations in a tavern between fictionalized critics and actual fictional book characters. Is this sort of critical fiction or is this the sort of critical fiction that you talked about earlier or is this something else? Did this form appear in American periodicals? Yeah, it, it was pretty common. I mean, there were in some of Charles Brockton Brown's magazines, he would, he would stage kind of critical debates between different characters that was kind of had a slightly fictionalized premise to it. Um, it critical, these kind of critical versions of critical debates were really um, common and widespread and took a whole variety of forms. I mean, the example that I gave in the talk early on was like, you know, a, a short story of someone who gets some bad reviews on his poetry and dies, you know, like that's a more melodramatic iteration of it. But certainly, I mean, the, the kind of back and forth dialogue that, that you're talking about, Sharon, was a really interesting kind of dialectical way to think mm -hmm. about critical issues, right? To not just stage one critical viewpoint, but to hear counterpoints and kind of a back and forth. So um, yeah, I mean, the kind of the, the range of these fictionalized um, kind of creative renderings of critical debates um, added levels of nuance to the kind of, of ways in which crit criticism was being understood in complex ways. So it's a really good question. Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, and we actually have Lynn Brooks, who's asking a question that continues down this uh, line. Uh, she asked, was US critical culture different from other critical developments in Europe or elsewhere in the Americas? Um, well, I, I mean, the short answer is yes, right? And, and actually one of the, common ways that observers in the early 19th century would would kind of explain differences in criticism was by national demarcations. So, um, you know, that English criticism had one particular cast to it. French criticism tended to be a little bit more analytic or critical. Um, they would often, um, you know, distinguish modes of criticism by national origin. Um, in you know the U.S., especially kind of along regional lines, um, this was something that like Poe would complain about that like kind of neglect frequently for Southern authors. When when Poe read um, Griswold's anthologies, he thought that like Southern writers were underrepresented. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned, that came up with Uncle Tom's Cabin was increasing divisions. Um, between critics from different regions based on these kind of unreconcilable differences over something like slavery. Yeah. Uh, so there were, there were sharp divides, but you know, increasingly at the same time during the 1830s and 40s, the increasing centralization of the print industry, um, you know, there, were, there were magazines that had a much larger reach. I mean, a Graham's magazine reached 40,000 people, right? As opposed to like a, a newspaper with more a regional. And scholars have argued back and forth about this. I mean, the people, you know, said we have this kind of consolidating national print industry, and quite a few scholars lately have said, well, no, it was still more regional than we like to think. But um, I, this is not a good answer. But there was a tension between, at least within the U.S., between a national critical culture and a still persistent regional culture. Um, and you know, in terms of your uh, national, international question, there were differences, but also a tremendous amount of copying and sharing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that, like Emerson learned a lot about German philosophy was through English reviews of German philosophers. You know, he, he would read Carlyle talking about Kant. <laughs> and so it's a lot of like remediation blurs those divisions, even while some there are real critical differences between different national cultures. And it's still true today. But if you read like criticism coming out of Germany today, it's like a lot of German systems theory and stuff like that, you know, it's um, there, there were and still are differences. Yeah. Out of curiosity, what does international copyright law look like in this period? 
uh, non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> largely. So it's the uh, Wild West. People are borrowing uh, from each other with abandon or? Yeah, there's no international copyright. So, um, but this is not to say there's still practices that people work out. There are kind of courtesies of the trade. Um, often a savvy author would try to get something often published in England first, you know, and then they would time the publications differently to try to like make as much money as they could before you start getting um, reprintings. I mean, there, you know, Meredith McGill has pointed out that like pirating isn't, isn't the correct term because it's not illegal. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a culture of, of widespread reprinting. And, you know, my point in, in talking about reprinting is that often stuff that is like reprinted gets disparaged and is on a kind of a lower level, but it was the norm, not the exception at the time, yeah. whether internationally um, or uh, not. I mean, this is one argument that, you know, uh, people have made, you know, like Michael Winship about the popularity of certain bestsellers like Charlotte Temple is particularly when they were, were international copyrights that were in effect, it was much easier for, um, you know, American publishers and British publishers to just print a lot of copies of things. So it actually helped big sellers become bigger, bigger sellers because there wasn't a copyright in place. And I should add, it was one of the most hotly debated topics within critical debates. Right. Mm -hmm. Everyone was Dickens and everyone was, they were always trying to get an international copyright, though it still didn't happen until the end of the 19th century. Um, incidentally, hi, Michael. He's also in attendance today. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Pleasure to have you. Um, just a, a last question for my own edification. Um, you mentioned that these forms of criticism, they sort of spiral in form and length, and you get to these book length refutations. Yeah. In that context, could you read? an anti-Tom as a piece of criticism? I mean, yeah, you could, right? I mean, it's, it's um, you know, uh, and for, for those who don't know, anti-Tom novels were these kind of like long um, pro-slavery apologist accounts of like the happy life of slaves in the South. Yeah. And which, you know, popped up after Uncle Tom's Cabins as, as ways to refute it, right? And I mean, you're right in a kind of a point by point way they offer opposite images that defend slavery, um, but they are novels, right? And so, I mean, this in, in this notion of critical fiction, I mean, you could say like, well, isn't every novel critical of certain things and like has a view on criticism, but there were, you know, genres that were more aggressively engaged with mm -hmm. criticism. And these, you know, these book length responses to Uncle Tom's Cabin, I mean, they really were like if you had written a 200 page review. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the craziest thing, I didn't mention this earlier, there were so many of them that at one, at one point there was a book length supposedly review of Uncle Tom's Cabin called Uncle Tom in Ruins. And it was actually a book length satire of book length reviews of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was like mocking the other forms. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, certainly anti-Tom novels were attacking and criticizing, um, though in a different, through a different genre. Sure. Well, I could keep you here all night, but that wouldn't mm -hmm. be merciful to you or to any of our lovely guests for joining us this evening. Um, thank you so much, Adam. This book sounds wonderful. And the fact that it's 26 bucks on a paperback <laughs> is I know. like a steal for an academic it, press. That's my point. Critical forms matter. If you yes. publish it in paperback and it's cheap, you can afford it. <laughs> it's very, very appropriate. Thank you so much for sharing your work thank, tonight. Thank you, Will, for inviting me to do this. Right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.